It's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Susan Young. She's well known to most of you in the audience, I'm sure. She's one of our clinical fellows. And just by way of background, um, she joined us uh, from the University of Pennsylvania where she received her doctorate in medicine um, after also doing her internal medicine residency at Vanderbilt University. And she got her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan uh, before again transitioning to the University of Pennsylvania for her doctorate in medicine and then uh, internship, intern medicine residency at Vanderbilt University, which I guess I didn't know, Susan, before I read your CV. Uh, that's pretty close to where I did a lot of my training as well. Mm -hmm. She will be uh, leaving us. Uh, she's a third year res uh, fellow. She'll be leaving us uh, this summer to join the Peace Health Group in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and, and actually in a short few months as I look at the calendar. She's been active in several um, efforts uh, over her young career, uh, being involved in some quality improvement efforts when she was at Vanderbilt University, and also since she's been here at the University of Washington. Uh, she's also been an active participant in our fellows and training program in the Washington chapter of the American College of Cardiology, and has had the opportunity uh, to, to journey both to Olympia and to Washington, D.C., uh, to lobby our legislators over health care issues regarding cardiovascular, delivery of cardiovascular care. She has uh, uh, several publications, um, mostly around uh, clinical care, which leads us to today's um, presentation, which is uh, regarding wearable technology and applications in cardiovascular care. And again, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Susan uh, for I think what's going to be a very interesting uh, presentation. Take it away, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Dean, for the kind introduction. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me. This morning, I'll be discussing wearable technology and their applications in cardiovascular care. I don't have any disclosures relevant to this topic. Our main objectives for this talk are to first understand the technology behind wearable devices and recognize potential sources of error in the data. Second, appreciate the variety of devices that are available and how they can be applied to patient care. Next, we'll um, look at how these devices have impacted cardiovascular outcomes and some limitations to more routine use. And finally, we'll consider some ways in which technologies can be further advanced and better integrated to improve patient care. So to provide everyone with a roadmap of our discussion, first, we'll start off with a case that inspired me to delve into this topic and then move on to a brief history of the development of wearable devices. Then we'll spend a minute um, going over the different technologies harbored within these devices, see some examples of devices being used in clinical application um, and how they can be applied to patient care. And then we'll learn about some outcomes data and discuss some limitations to this technology before brainstorming ways in which we can take this further. So first, starting out with a patient that I encountered during my first year of training. This is a 42-year-old male physician with a history of hyperlipidemia presenting with chest pressure. The chest pressure began the night prior to presentation and persisted throughout the night into the next morning um, and also continued to worsen. He owns an Apple Watch, took a single lead ECG, which did show SD depressions. Um, so knowing what that meant, he came into the ED. And just as a side note, um, the single lead ECG taken by the Apple Watch is similar to lead one on a standard ECG. Upon arrival, his troponin was elevated at 0.12 and his ECG also showed inferior ST elevations. So not surprisingly, this patient had an acute lesion in the RCA and it was subsequent, subsequently stented with a good result. The patient had an uncomplicated hospital course and continues to do well up to this day. There wasn't anything especially groundbreaking about the STEMI presentation but what was really intriguing to me was the fact that his Apple Watch detected SD depressions. 
Up to that point, I had often taken patient claims of having arrhythmias detected by their phones or watches with a grain of salt because it just always seemed like there was so much error in, in these devices. But this patient's case really got me to think about just how accurate devices are nowadays and if we should trust it enough to incorporate that data into patient care. It seems like we're flooded with new devices or apps on a daily basis, but it's interesting to look back at the humble beginnings leading up to these devices. It seems very rudimentary now, but one of the first technological advances was actually the development of watches that had a moving second hand um, back in the 1800s. And that was what allowed people to measure heart rate and time cardiac events. Over a century later, Norman Halter developed a device that could transmit ECG tracings. And even though it was a wearable backpack, I'm not sure how mobile it was weighing at 85 pounds. A few years later, he developed a more portable ECG device to address patient concerns of palpitations. This device consisted of an electrocardiocorder, which hooked up to um, electrodes that the patient wears. And basically it's a battery operated tape recorder that um, continuously recorded ECGs for 10 hours. And then that data was sent over to the electrocardio scanner, which analyzed and um, gave interpretable outputs. In 1973, pedometers were first used in the research setting to um, assess clinical trials where the outcome was distance walked. And then this, the technology was stagnant for a while until 2001 when Zoll developed the LifeVest, which was one of the first devices that not only monitored and recorded data, but also automatically acted on it by delivering shocks. In 2002, the first mobile telemetry system was developed, which is a precursor to our halter and CAM monitors now. It recorded EKG data and transmitted it via cellular connections. And it also contained algorithms to automatically detect and transmit concerning events. Since then, especially in the past five to 10 years, we've seen a huge influx of increasingly advanced technologies. Um, most of these are targeted towards consumers, and these technologies include uh, mobile apps, devices, and even the smartphone itself acting as a device. It's estimated that 81% of Americans currently own a smartphone, and this data is now a little bit outdated, but there are over 400 unique devices from over 100 brands in wrist-worn trackers alone. It's estimated that um, that devices are expected to exceed 1.1 billion by next year. And it's also a very substantial market. Um, remote, remote patient monitoring is estimated to generate nearly $5 billion annually. And a lot of this is accounted for by connected medical devices. Clearly, this is a very su substantial market. And um, with so much invested in this market, I'm sure we'll see continued growth both in technology and interest from businesses and healthcare systems alike. Before we see some examples of the available devices, let's spend a little bit, bit of time understanding the technology that underlies it so we can better appreciate better, uh, possible sources of error. The most commonly used piece of equipment is the accelerometer. And not only is it present and probably in all of our phones and on all of our wrists right now, but it can also be incorporated into textiles or clothing. Accelerometers detect acceleration by measuring the displacement of the sensor in this uh, diagram M or the mechanical stress applied um, in the system, which is in here K. And it collects data from all three axes of movement. Accelerometers are probably most recognized as activity tracking devices, but they can also be applied for heart sound monitoring. By evaluating auditory vibrations, it can potentially detect certain uh, conditions based on the intensity, frequency, quality, and duration of these vibrations. 
A major limitation is, of course, noise from motion artifacts. The lithocardiogram, or BCG, is an accelerometer-based technique, but rather than measuring large-scale whole body movements like walking, it detects the subtle repetitive motions that come with each cardiac cycle and each round of blood ejection. This is how our watches can detect heart rate, um, but it can also be used to measure blood pressure without the use of a cuff or um, to evaluate myocardial contractility. Another accelerometer-based technique is seismocardiogram or SCG. It differs from BCG in that um, rather than measuring uh, whole body motions, it's a sensor placed on the chest to detect only subtle chest wall vibrations. So in addition to gathering information on heart rate, blood pressure, and cardiac output, just as BCG could, um, because of the localized nature of these measurements, it can also integrate that data to detect structural abnormalities or differentiate between compensated and decompensated heart failure. This picture here shows um, the output and data that the SCG gives. And uh, in, th in this example, this is a heart failure patient in a compensated state versus decompensated state. And you can see that clearly there's a difference in the nature of their chest wall motions between compensated and decompensated. Um, SCG is prone to motion artifact, just as with all other accelerometer-based techniques but placement of the sensor can also significantly change the data acquired, which is probably partly why it's not used by the mainstream public yet. Another piece of familiar technology is photoplethysmography or PPG. It's the same technology used in pulse oximeters, which is optical technology that detects variations in blood volume within the microvasculature. It can work with existing cameras um, within smartphones or be an accessory device uh, as a separate, separate sensor. And by measuring the pulsatile activity of the microvasculature, it's able to detect the heart rate and heart rhythm. Since a lot of this technology is dependent on light penetration, the measurements can be impacted by body movement, um, body temperature, body hair, skin color, and even tattoos. Um, Electrode-based technology is also becoming increasingly used. It's able to record a single lead ECG using two vectors. And in the case of watches, usually the bottom surface of the watch serves as one vector and the uh, user has to touch another part of the watch to serve as the second vector but there um, can also be connected accessory devices where um, users can just place both hands on to serve as both vectors. Not only are um, these electro-based techniques and devices able to detect heart rate and rhythm, um, but they can also take single lead ECGs that have the potential to detect ischemia just as with a heart patient. Of course, um, as with any regular 12 lead ECGs, these readings are subject to noise and artifacts, and we're also limited to a single lead analysis. Now we'll get into some of the less mainstream techniques that are currently available. Um, so first is remote dielectric sensing or RUDS. In the form of a vest, it measures the different dielectric properties of tissues to quantify pulmonary edema. The data is reported as a percentage of lung congestion with normal being 25 to 35%. Initial studies showed that um, RADS measurements correlate very well with chest CT in discriminating between um, compensated and decompensated heart failure. The table on top shows the CT findings of pulmonary congestion for the two different heart failure groups, um, de uh, compensated and decompensated here. And the bottom table shows the REDS findings, which as you can see, are pretty similar to the CT values. In the outpatient setting, this can be used to detect preclinical changes in volume status for heart failure patients. However, clothing can affect measurements and other diseases within the chest, such as COPD, could also introduce error. 
And um, since this vest also carries more bulk than something worn on the wrist, compliance is also a bit more of a concern. Finally, bioimpedance is a technique that measures transthoracic impedance using electrodes embedded again within the vest. Transthoracic impedance has been shown to correlate very well with intrathoracic impedance, which is inversely correlated with pulmonary congestion. So basically the lower the, the transthoracic impedance, the more congestion there is. Similar to REDS, um, clothing, pulmonary disease, and compliance may affect the data. There are hundreds of devices currently available. So I'll just highlight some of the ones that are primarily intended for health monitoring. First, I'm gonna spend a minute on the Apple Watch, which clearly wasn't developed purely for health reasons, but it is one of the most prevalent devices that are out there and it, it incorporates many of the technologies that we just discussed. So in addition to tracking your heart rate and telling you whether you have an arrhythmia, which are more um, accelerometer or PPG based techniques, you can also take a single lead ECG. Here's an example of the output that the Apple Watch gives you. And you can see that it tells you the heart rate, whether or not you're in sinus rhythm, and whether or not it thinks you have AFib. And it also um, makes it clear in fine print on the bottom that this is similar to lead one on a standard ECG. Notably, the Apple Watch has received FDA clearance for the ECG feature as well as the a regular rhythm notification feature. Besides wrist-worn devices, there are um, also smartphone accessories that can be used to detect arrhythmias. Cardia Mobile, which was developed by AliveCore, takes an ECG using leads that are contained within this touchpad. Um, and it can also notify the user whether or not they're an AFib. This uh, device has FDA clearance, but for the ECG feature only. ECG Check is an actual phone case that takes an ECG when the user um, touches the electrodes that are embedded within the case itself. And again, this has FDA clearance for the ECG feature alone. And in the realm of apps, Pulse Smart uses PPG technology to light up the fingertip using the phone's camera and it can determine the patient's heart rate and heart rhythm. Um, but additionally, it can also identify PACs and PVCs while many of the other devices, including the Apple Watch, doesn't um, actually uh, send that notification or make that diagnosis. This particular app doesn't have FDA clearance yet, but there's a more advanced and costlier version made by the same company that does have um, FDA clearance for the ECG feature. Finally, Scanadu Scout is a device that can not only detect arrhythmias, but um, can acquire many more parameters. And it basically gives you a full set of vitals with blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. It's a little funny looking, but the patient holds um, the device between two fingertips and points it at their forehead. It's unclear why, but this device did not receive FDA approval or clearance despite trials showing that it was safe and effective. And subsequently it was discontinued in 2017. So moving on from the arrhythmia detection devices, um, more accurate blood pressure monitoring devices are also being developed. And because they're still being developed, a lot of them don't have names yet. But one such device is this small sensor that's um, attached to the back of a smartphone. The user presses their hand on it. And when they want to take a blood pressure measurement, they hold it up, making sure to be in line with the level of the heart. And the sensor uses BCG technology to translate that into blood pressure. There's also a pressure sensor that can be worn continuously over the wrist and blood pressure is detected using microfluidic techniques. Another proposed device is one that incorporates both SCG and BCG technology via a chest patch, which, which is the SCG part and the wristwatch, which is the BCG component. 
Um, and this system, in addition to detecting blood pressure, is supposedly able to provide many more parameters. Finally, there's a more comprehensive system in development to assess cardiopulmonary fitness as a whole. It's a vest with built-in sensors, and um, there are also connections for all these different electrodes and also an optical probe to be clipped on the ear. It's pretty bulky, but it can monitor heart rate, oxygen saturation, and activity level. And it can also assess dynamic changes in cardiopulmonary function during activity. It has been studied for use in the clinic setting during a six minute walk test, um, but this clearly has the potential to be simplified for easier outpatient use. So now that we've touched on some of these different devices, let's see how they can be applied in caring for our patients. Since the majority of devices that are available to consumers are activity or heart rate trackers in some form, we can harness that widespread use into preventing cardiovascular disease. It's no surprise that inactivity is linked to increased cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. So we can improve outcomes simply by motivating patients to move more. It's been shown that simply wearing pedometers increases users' daily activity levels, decreases BMI, and lowers blood pressure. Even better, use of a more involved um, activity tracking device such as the Fitbit has been shown to increase activity, activity level even further than a pedometer alone. And for obese patients, using mobile apps or wearable devices has also been shown to lead to greater weight loss. Disease screening is a common application of these devices, especially since the majority of them are centered on detecting arrhythmias. For example, the Apple Heart Study which included nearly 420,000 participants, showed that the Apple Watch can be helpful in detecting asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. The watch first notified users that um, they had an irregular rhythm, and notably this was via PPG technology and not the ECG feature, so it might be a little less accurate. But the participants who received the notification then wore a seven-day continuous monitor and 34% of those um, who wore that monitor ended up ultimately being diagnosed with AFib. Aside from arrhythmia screening though, these um, wearable devices can also be useful in risk stratifying patients with known cardiovascular disease. For example, we can potentially track vitals or activity levels in patients with valvular heart disease or heart failure or any patient whose functional status has a major impact on decision-making. In addition to simply preventing disease or screening for disease, we can also use these technologies to help us actively change management. We started with an example of a patient who came in because he saw SD depressions on his Apple Watch. What if, similar to how your watch may notify you that you have an arrhythmia, it can also send a notification for ischemia? It turns out that ischemia detection using electrode technology is fairly decent. One group studied how accurate smartphone-derived ECGs are in detecting STEMIs. And for this study, they included um, 200 patients who presented with symptoms that were concerning for a STEMI. They took um, a standard ECG on presentation and also took a smartphone-derived ECG. Um, and in this study, it was within a live core attached to an iPod touch. And what they found was that the correlation was actually pretty decent. The sensitivity and specificity of STEMI detection were 0.89 and 0.84 respectively, with a positive predictive value of 0.7 and negative predictive value of 0.95. So it seems that the ischemia de detection, at least with the alive core, um, can be relatively reliable. In the realm of heart failure, the REDS vest has been um, able to identify residual pulmonary congestion in patients with decompensated heart failure. This small study included 100 hospitalized, hospitalized patients um, and 
they took measurements with the vest on the day that these patients were felt clinically ready for discharge. The vest identified residual pulmonary congestion, which were defined as levels higher than the defined uh, range of normal in a third of these patients. And the patients who had residual congestion then underwent additional diuresis. On average, they were able to be diuresed an additional three kilograms with two more days added to their length of stay. And only one of these patients developed a significant rise in creatinine after this additional diuresis. Bioimpedance monitoring was also shown to detect preclinical heart failure decompensation um, up to two weeks before actual hospitalization. This study included 91 heart failure patients who were monitored with a bioimpedance vest and a traditional weight scale. And it showed that for patients who eventually decompensated, their bioimpedance measurements, which are shown in green here, fell much earlier and the alarm came on much earlier than any changes in weight were detected, which is shown in blue. Another piece of technology for heart failure um, seismocardiography, which is that pa chest patch that we talked about, um, can also potentially differentiate between compensated and decompensated heart failure like we discussed earlier. For this study, they included 45 patients with chronic heart failure, um, and it was a mix between compensated and decompensated patients. They plotted their SCG data as um, a graph similarity score with compensated here and decompensated here, and they found a um, significant difference in the data between the two groups. For the patients who were decompensated, they also compare their data um, at baseline or on admission when they're in that decompensated state to discharge when presumably they're in a more compensated state. And um, it's not shown here, but they also found a significant difference there as well. Even though many of these heart failure technologies aren't widely used yet, there's a great deal of potential in using that to care for our patients. Finally, in considering how we can use these technologies, research is another area to explore. Activity level, um, as determined by an activity tracker, has been used in various studies, um, such as determining the relationship between postoperative activity and length of stay after a major surgery, um, including cardiac surgery. Or um, it can also be, activity level can also be used as an endpoint in drug trials. And um, in particular, one study looked at the use of nitrates for heart failure patients in improving activity. So now that we've discussed the various ways we can use this device, these devices, what data do we have on um, actual patient outcomes with these technologies? There aren't many trials on cardiovascular outcomes specific to the wearable devices that we talked about yet, um, but there was a meta-analysis looking at the impact of a range of digital health interventions, including telemedicine, web-based monitoring, email messaging, mobile phone or app uh, tracking, text messaging, and monitoring sensors. The studies included in this meta-analysis included both primary and secondary prevention studies, and the outcomes that they looked at included MI, stroke, revascularization, hospitalization, and all-cause mortality. As you can see, overall, outcomes were better in patients who underwent digital health interventions compared to patients who um, received usual care. Out of the roughly 1,200 patients who were in the digital health intervention group, about 100 of them developed events, whereas in the 1,000 patients in the usual care group, 160 of them developed events. We can also see that digital health interventions seem to have more of an, of an effect for secondary prevention of cardiovascular diseases as well as for heart failure patients compared to um, primary prevention alone. And in the realm of heart failure, a preliminary study also showed that the REDS vest may be useful in reducing readmissions. Um, it was a very small pilot study, but 50 patients were admitted for decompensated heart failure 
And on discharge, they were instructed to wear the RUDS vest for 90 days. And after 90 days, they then took the vest off. They compared the readmission rates um, of these patients during that 90 days they wore the vest compared to the 90 days before they started wearing the vest and the 90 days after they took the vest off. And you can see that compared to the pre and post REDS periods, there was a significant reduction in heart failure admissions while patients were wearing the vest. Technologies like this vest um, aren't routinely used yet, but it's conceivable that they can really help us make a significant impact in reducing um, disease burden and mortality of many forms of cardiovascular disease. Of course, as with the introduction of anything new in medicine, including technology, there are initial barriers to widespread use. For many of the devices that we discussed, the patient has to wear it for prolonged periods of time, and they also need to have some degree of technological proficiency. So patient comfort, compliance, familiarity, and battery life can be issues. This can be a problem for many of our patients who tend to be older. Device use has been shown to be um, lower in patients who are elderly, and specifically in, the, in terms of smartphone use, while 81% of the general American public owns a smartphone, only 63% of those older than 65 own one. If we're going to apply this data towards patient care, we're also relying on it to be um, accurate. Errors in accuracy can come from the device itself, like we talked about earlier, but the user can also um, introduce error and there may be physiologic outliers that throw off built-in algorithms. Um, risk, tractor, risk trackers are um, one of the most widely studied in terms of accuracy. And what's, what these um, studies show is basically that accuracy depends not only on the specific device that's being used, but also on the activity that the patient is performing while wearing the tracker. This graph on the left shows how four popular devices compare with standardized measurements in terms of heart rate and energy expenditure. And um, this study included the Apple Watch, Fitbit Charge, Samsung Gear, and Mio Alpha. And as you can see, all four of them aren't too far off from the standard measurements. But the study on the right here shows many more devices and um, clearly some uh, significantly underestimated the measurements while others significantly overestimated. And this next study shows how um, six popular devices perform um, at rest and at different activity levels. So all of these devices did pretty well in terms of measuring heart rate at rest and they were all fairly accurate. And they also did relatively well when patients were on the treadmill, but they almost all struggled when patients were on an elliptical and especially when they were on an elliptical without holding onto the arm handles. The only one that performed um, consistently well with a correlation um, above 0.9 was the Apple Watch. So just if you're going to get one device, maybe invest in an Apple Watch. Um, but basically, we just have to keep in mind that when patients tell us what their watch says, we have to consider what they're wearing and also what they're doing at the time. Another consideration we have to make with wearable devices is how to integrate that information into the patient's care. On a patient-directed level, are isolated or incidental findings enough to alter management? And on a more technological level, the data that we receive from patients' devices um, isn't easily integrated within the patient's electronic health record yet, at least. Um, but even if this data could be automatically imported, we already have so many ways of monitoring patients remotely, including with vital signs or ICD interrogations. And it can be challenging and time consuming to tackle this additional piece of information. With new technology also come costs. How will physicians or healthcare facilities be reimbursed for 
the resources that are spent interpreting this data. And um, without standardized reimbursement codes, there may be less of an incentive to use this information. And also building the infrastructure to analyze, interpret, and respond to the influx of data from wearable devices would require additional funding, which may be hard to come by. Finally, ethical and security concerns arise anytime digital data is involved. First off, who owns the, the data? Is it the patient or the device company that collects and stores the data? And it's often not specified how this data is gonna be used. Is it simply collected and stored? Is it being used in research or is it sold to a third party? And along similar lines, who has access to that data? If it's accessible to insurance companies, will it affect premiums? And of course, sensitive, identifiable information is collected, so cybersecurity is always a concern. In spite of these barriers, wearable devices show a great deal of promise in improving care for our patients. To get there, we need more studies on specific devices um, or types of devices and how they impact outcomes so we can learn which ones we can rely on and how to interpret that information. If we can also determine the economic impact of these devices, such as reducing hospitalizations or preventing unnecessary procedures, for example, it could also pave the way to um, clear reimbursement or funding issues. Um, we need to figure out ways to make the information from patients' personal devices easier to obtain, interpret, and store. And also currently many of the devices that patients own um, only monitor one or two parameters, but many people own more than one device. So if we can integrate the information from different devices and different technologies, it may help paint a more complete picture of the patient's clinical status. For example, for a heart failure patient, maybe Alexa can use speech or voice analysis to detect that the patient is short of breath. And maybe the patient can hold up um, their phone to their neck and using PPG technology, find the JVP. And maybe in the future, there's a patch they can wear to monitor their electrolytes. All of these parameters would tell both the patient and us that they're in heart failure. And finally, there are many devices developed to assist care providers in caring for our patients, but many of them could potentially be repurposed to be more patient-directed. For example, Steth.io and EcoCore are two um, stethoscopes that are integrated with smartphones. Steth.io records the findings, whereas EcoCore can also um, make a diagnosis. Currently, they're marketed to providers to assist in making the diagnosis or to um, healthcare institutions, teaching institutions for physical exam learning. But this would also be pretty straightforward for patients to use, especially during this time of telemedicine visits. The patient could be instructed on where to place a stethoscope and um, the provider could see a uh, live interpretation of the heart sounds. We still have a long ways to go before these devices are routinely incorporated into patient care, but as we gather more data on these devices and become more adept at integrating that information, we have the potential to substantially improve patient outcomes. So I would like to thank Dr. Dean again for your time and um, help with this presentation. And thank you everyone for spending your morning with me and I'm happy to take any questions.